Coming up on Doctype, ponies! I'm just kidding. We're going to cover the basics of CSS positioning. Then, do you like JavaScript? Do you also like putting things off until later? Then your dreams are about to come true. So prepare to make the jump to hyperspace because it's time for Doctype. This episode of Doctype is brought to you by Less Comp and GoDaddy. I'm Nick Pettit. And I'm Jim Hoskins. And you're watching Doctype. Whether you're a designer that doesn't know the difference between JavaScript and a decaf latte, or a developer who can't tell his margin from his padding, Doctype has the latest tips, tricks, and tools to help make you the emperor of the interwebs. Alrighty, so this week we have a viewer question. That's right, Elliot writes, what about discussing a little about CSS positioning? For example, when to use floats for positioning versus when to use relative or absolute positioning for positioning. Well, Elliot, we thought that would make a pretty awesome two-part episode, so here is part one. Let's get into it. The position property in CSS is often misunderstood, but when you're creating a layout, it's essential to understand how it works. Position allows you to break outside the normal flow of content on your page. By default, the position property is set to static on all your page elements. By setting position to absolute, you can take an element out of the normal flow of content and specify its exact location on your page. Using the top, left, bottom, and right properties, you can position the element. For example, if we wanted to move an element to the upper left corner of the page with a bit of spacing from the edge, we could say left 100 pixels and top 200 pixels. This would move the element 100 pixels away from the left edge and 200 pixels from the top of the page. Sometimes when you're scrolling down a web page, you'll notice that some elements appear to be stuck or they move with you as you're scrolling down the page. Most of the time, this effect is achieved using fixed positioning. When you set the position property to fixed, your element will be positioned relative to the viewport, as opposed to absolute where it is relative to the page. In other words, as a user scrolls down the page, the element will stay in the same place. When they resize their browser window, the element will maintain its position relative to the edge of the viewport. After you set an element to use fixed positioning, you just have to specify the top, right, bottom, and or left properties. It should be noted that fixed positioning doesn't usually work on mobile devices, and although there are many hacks to get around this, it's way beyond the scope of this episode. Relative positioning confuses a lot of people, but it's actually pretty simple. When you set an element's position to relative, and then use top, right, bottom, and left to move the element, you're actually just telling the browser to move the element from where it would normally be on the page. In other words, the element will be positioned relative to itself. You can also use relative positioning to contain an absolutely positioned element. So for example, if you wanted one element to appear in the upper right of its parent element, you would set the parent to relative positioning and the child element to absolute. Then you could use the top and right properties to position the element appropriately. Now you super sleuths out there will notice that I didn't cover the float property. That's because floats can be very tricky and there's a lot to discuss. Tune into Doctype next week for part two and learn how floats work. Now next, Jim is gonna talk about set timeout in JavaScript or as we like to call it, planned procrastination. But first, we're gonna take a look at a conference from the future. The future? That's right, Jim. The future. Sometimes in JavaScript you want to do something, but just not right now. JavaScript's set timeout function lets you put off for tomorrow what you could be doing today. 
When you have some code that you want to run later, the best way to do it is to use JavaScript's setTimeout function. SetTimeout is pretty simple. It takes two parameters. The first is the code you would like to run, and the second is the delay before you run that code. The delay parameter is in milliseconds, so if you wanted your code to run in two seconds, you would give the delay parameter the number 2000. Your code won't necessarily run precisely after that time, because if the JavaScript engine is busy with some other code, it'll wait for that piece of code to run to completion before your set timeout code will be executed. The code parameter can be either a string or a function. You can pass it the name of a function, and it'll be called when it's time to call it. You do not put parentheses on the function because that will call the function right away, instead of giving the function to set timeout. If you want to pass arguments to your function, you can wrap the full function call inside of an anonymous function. Then later, your anonymous function will be called, and since it created a closure around the scope you defined it in, you can safely use any variables you could access when you defined it. If you're going to pass set timeout a method, you'll again want to wrap the whole expression inside of an anonymous function. If you just pass it the method itself, it will lose track of what object it is being called on, and the variable this inside the function will be wrong. The other way is to use a string JavaScript expression. This has problems because closures won't work correctly in the string so you can't put any variable names into your string unless they're globals. It may be a few more characters to construct an anonymous function versus a string, but it will make your code way more maintainable. If you want to call your code more than once, repeating over a certain interval, then set interval is what you want to use. Just like set timeout, set interval takes two arguments, code and delay. Set interval can be useful for constructing animations. Usually simple animations consist of a piece of code that changes a property a little bit over and over again. Now most of the time, you want your animation to stop. That's where clear interval and clear timeout come in handy. When you call set interval or set timeout, the return value will be a number. All by itself, this number is pretty meaningless, but it can be used to stop your timeouts or intervals. If you set a timeout but wanted to cancel it before it was called, you can use the clear timeout function. When you define your timeout, set its return variable into a variable. Then if you decide you want to stop it, you can call clear timeout with that variable. Similarly, you can capture the interval number from set interval and then call clear interval with that number. This is particularly useful if you're doing an animation and you've animated all the way through, you can just call clear interval and you're done. Set timeout and set interval give you really powerful ways to call your JavaScript later. When used properly, these can help you create really cool effects. Listen, you need a domain name. You know it, I know it, but where are you gonna go get it? GoDaddy, that's where. If you're looking to drive viewers to your video content, then .tv domains are where it's at. .tv domains are perfect for podcasters, video bloggers, and anyone with something to say. And they're available now at GoDaddy.com. Heck, where do you think we got Doctype.tv from? So we know you all get your domains from GoDaddy, but whose code are you gonna use? Enter the code Doctype3 when you check out and save an additional 10% off your entire order. Some restrictions apply see site for details get your piece of the internet at godaddy.com that's it for this week until next time be sure to check us out at facebook.com slash doctype and follow at doctype tv on twitter and if you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode of doctype send us an email at questions at doctype.tv and if you subscribe by itunes or rss you'll never miss an episode of doctype so why not so until next tuesday remember that every great web page starts with doctype